Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for taking some time and joining us today. I'm Ashley Skid, the Director of Marketing here at Temple Communications, and we are just about to start our webinar, checking POE. So just a couple minutes and we'll bring you that awesome content. Um, first, a couple of housekeeping notes. We're gonna keep you all on mute, but please do use the chat throughout the webinar if you have any questions. Um, we'll most likely collect them at the end. Um, but if there's anything pressing, just please go ahead and use that chat function. And then the webinar recording will be available in two to three business days on our website. It will also go out via email. Um, so since you've registered for this webinar, you'll also get the link uh, via email. Um, so that should come out in just a couple of days. Um, so today your presenter is Mark Govier. Mark Govier is the product manager for Tempo's wide range of telecommunications and varied utility marker products. Mark is a talented electrical engineer with 30 years of experience and uh, with the design and development of Tempo products as senior engineer and product manager. And Mark, I now hand it over to you. Okay, well, welcome to the world of Power Over Ethernet. So today we're gonna to talk about Power Over Ethernet, how it's going to become more widely used, what might go wrong and what you can do to fix that. So I'm going to start with the very basics about what power over Ethernet or PoE, some people call it just PoE, it, uh, is, where it's used, where it will be used, and how it works. We'll then consider how you can check for the correct provision of PoE and suggest what might go wrong. I'll then give you an example of a tester to help diagnose an odd situation where a power over Ethernet phone is dead on the desk uh, this is a good example as it gives uh, confusing results. We'll stop for some questions and answers at the end before I give you a devilish quiz to check you've been paying uh, attention. <clears throat> Power over Ethernet. Hopefully, we're all familiar with cabled Ethernet. Nowadays, this is being provided using Cat5 and higher rated cables made up of four pairs of copper wire. Each pair is very tightly twisted to reduce noise effects and keep the bandwidth up. But there's an increasing drive to utilize power over Ethernet, not just for applications like security cameras and building monitoring and management, but for more mundane things like lighting. Items which are powered over the Ethernet cable are called powered devices. So those are the things at the far end, often abbreviated to PD. And power is fed onto the cable, either at the origin end or the other end where the device would be called a power sourcing equipment or PSE or via a gadget in line with the cable route called a mid-span injector. Power over Ethernet advantages. Well, there are some disadvantages. Let's talk about that first. Efficiency is slightly less. Voltages are lower um, for safety and therefore currents are higher for any given load and carried on generally smaller conductors. Plus, it's being converted at least two times more. So that can increase the losses compared to mains. But for relatively low power applications, the reduction in needs for additional mains cabling can be massive. As many Ethernet systems, particularly in significant installations, are already backed up in terms of power, um, then those switches can be configured to ensure that the power remains fed to essential items, whilst others are progressively powered down during prolonged use. Um, but there's a major advantage, of course, being that only one cable needs to be run to any individual device. You don't have to have it near to a power socket on the wall. You don't have to have a little wall adapter. It's all dealt with centrally. It's all controlled centrally. So power over the unit has huge advantages from that point. Another term you're going to hear in this presentation is about phantom power. Or you might have heard about that. Uh, maybe people who've ever used um, sort of balanced microphones in the day are used to what phantom power is, but basically it's a way of feeding power as well as audio in the case of a microphone or in our case, high frequency digital signals over wires that doesn't interfere with those AC signals. And we'll do more about that later. And then you're also going to hear about things called alternative A, mode A, alternative B, mode B, classes one to eight, which define the power capability. Then the types of power sources, types one to four, which can support different numbers of classes. So we have the phantom power on two pairs. We have all the pairs in the cable. So they might be on the same pairs, 
pairs one and two normally in three and six, which is the common data pairs. It might be on the spare pairs. It might be on all four pairs, like your data could be. And as I say, then there's going to be these different types of equipment powering the, powering the cable, supporting different classes of power capability. So the power sourcing equipment, so remember this is the thing at the beginning of the uh, network. This applies between three and 10 volts to the line, um, which is then monitored to correct, the, uh, check that the current is flowing in the, in, in the system. If the power sourcing equipment detects a, uh, a load of about 25,000 ohms, forgetting to press the go button here, um, then it will proceed to classify um, the actual provision. So it, if you imagine the far end device, the, the thing at the far end, the power device, applies 25,000 ohm resistor to the circuit, that small amount of current then triggers the power sourcing equipment to uh, begin a classification process. Yeah, so um, we've mentioned a few buzzwords already. Powered devices, powered sourcing equipment, classification, phantom power, and more. But let's now try and add some more detail around these without getting too bogged down into the actual uh, super low detail. So looking at those devices again, so at the one end, perhaps at the switch, or at um, uh, uh, some something where the circuit is originating, we have what we call the power sourcing equipment. At the far end, we have a powered device. And in between, we have what is known as the link section. Well, to us, it's called the Cat5 cable and the RJ45 plugs on the ends. Um, so the link section is the physical media over which the Ethernet is carried. And in our case, it's the copper pairs. So let's move on to talk a little bit more about the presentation of the power. This is where it gets complicated. The power interface, that's the connector at which the date the, the data and the power is being presented, um, is the sockets effectively at either end of the link. And then we have the link section. As I said, that meant that's basically the cable. And then there are fundamentally two alternative ways of connecting the DC power onto the cables, which are also carrying the AC signal. There's a thing we call alternative A which is where it originates from the power sourcing equipment. And that's applied to the, let's call them the main signaling pairs or the primary pair set, as it's called. Um, so this is the pair of wires that will carry the data and also carry the, the power at the same time. And then when this reaches the powered device, it's known as mode A. So alternative A, mode A are just two names for the same thing opposite end of the cable. The alternative B originates more commonly at a mid-span injector, and it's applied to the spare pair of pairs, if that makes sense, those that do not carry the AC Ethernet signals. So mostly that would be pairs four and five, uh, wires four and five, seven and eight. So that would be what would be used as alternative B and it's mode B when it gets to the actual uh, power device at the far end. Now, there are also some types and classes of provision that need to use all four pairs, but then also we know that there are some high speed data links which also use all four pairs. So again, this is this is how the, the whole thing of 802.3 has grown over the years and added more capabilities onto the same cables, which is fantastic. But for now, keep in mind, we're trying to spread the power equally among as many individual conductors as possible, and that minimizes the losses and maximizes the available power at the far end without creating electrical risks or compromising the Ethernet signaling itself. So if you're not aware already, um, you're going to be, <laughs> um, Ethernet data is carried over these twisted pairs utilizing what's called balanced signaling. So that's a signal which is applied across the pairs and there's one pair up and one pair down normally and can be two but normally it's one pair at one pair down it's the easiest way to think about it and um the data is carried on both wires of those pairs but in opposite polarity in each case up and down and the vast majority of devices will just use auto negotiation and determine which pair is going to be used for transmit and which is going to be used for um, receive and what the link speed will be so that'll be sort of like a little mutual agreement between the switch and the device and it's um you know, that, that, that'll just sort out the, the speed and also which pairs are going to be used in which direction. 
And the other thing is that's quite good about this is, of course, you'll hardly ever come across those hideous crossover cables that we used to have in the old days. And sometimes you'd have to have a crossover cable. Sometimes you didn't. It was just a pain in the backside. At least nowadays, it almost doesn't matter. So the balance signaling over the wires is essential, and that ensures the signal integrity and the high speeds are carried for up to 100 meters. And it's achieved by interfacing the little silicon chips inside your unit to the cable using little tiny transformers. Now, the windings of those transformers, I'll show you in a schematic very shortly, are center taps. Now, don't worry if you don't know what that means. I'll show you the schematic. It'll make a bit more sense. Um, but those transformer center taps allow for the DC power basically to be taken from both wires of the pair, whilst the AC signal is carried in a balanced way onto the line. And because that DC current is flowing in both ends of the transformer in opposite directions, it doesn't saturate the core of the transformer and doesn't add any noise to the, the signaling. So it's, it's a very clever way of um, carrying data on a circuit that, that is um, clear. So what I'm trying to show you here is the two, two situations. Um, there's, there's three really, but I, it's easy enough to show two on a slide. First one is the, is the sort of typical situation where you have a powered sourcing equipment, I'll use the, the laser pointer thing here. Uh, so the, the power sourcing equipment is on the left here, and we've got the standard color scheme for connection of uh, pairs between the power sourcing equipment and the powered device. We've got to consider that each of those wires, conductors, is the correct term, has a resistance. Um, so the resistance becomes important. The length becomes important because obviously um, both the signaling and the data are defined within the 802.3 uh, standards to allow for up to 100 meters or 300 plus feet of um, distance. And the resistance of the wires, which is represented by these chunks here, um, is, is important because the resistance of the, the, the solid colored wire versus the white dashed wire has to be pretty much the same because otherwise you'll get an imbalance in that DC flowing along each pair. We'll show that in the schematic in a second. But it's absolutely critical when you get to higher power loads where these currents become more significant. And if those are unbalanced, then you can actually induce more uh, errors and uh, problems into the actual data link. Um, modern Ethernet chips are pretty damn good at getting over um, little problems, especially on shorter cables. Um, then they can even cope with one of the wires being partly disconnected or very high resistance. So it's amazing what, what the chip will get, get away with. But as you start putting more and more um, power over the link as well, that's going to just make the problems worse because you're, you're messing with the capabilities of the little transformers on the board. So we've mentioned these um, transformers. So on the next slide now, I'm going to show you what these transformers look like. Uh, this is what this schematic, um, so again, so here are the transformers, but this schematic uh, shows how this works in a practical implementation of a, of a powered device. So the power sourcing equipment is very similar, but instead of having a, a, a powered device controller, it's going to have a power sourcing controller and it's going to have a, a power source rather than a load. But we're looking here at the let's call it the right hand end of the of the drawing as, as we've been drawing it so far. And if we consider that these are the normal data pairs up here, and then these are the sort of secondary data pairs, then this would be what we would call mode A, and this would be called mode B. So this is where you'd normally get power from a uh, power injecting device, a mid-span injector. And this is where you'd normally get power from a uh, powered sourcing equipment. So this shows the two wires. So let's assume this is the primary pair, or just call it pair A of the, of the four pairs. We've got two wires coming into a transformer, and we've got one wire on this side, the primary side, coming out and going to a bridge rectifier. And then the other pair of the same pair set, we have them again going to ends of a transformer, and the center tap coming to the opposite end of the bridge rectifier. So that way, whether this pair has both wires positive or this pair has both wires positive and the opposite negative, the bridge rectifier can ensure that the power taken or presented by the power sourcing equipment and carried over the pairs to these points can then be presented into the powered device. The powered device has um, a a key resistance there. 
we mentioned it already, but basically that 25,000 ohm detection resistor, it takes just enough current basically to wake up the powered sourcing equipment uh, way off there on the left. And once the powered sourcing equipment has detected that little bit of um, current flowing, it'll go through a hardware process to negotiate the power with the powered device. And the powered device will actually pulse loads onto the current Onto, onto of the current from the power from the power sourcing equipment to indicate how much it wants. Uh, at the, up to that point, it can't take more than the basic amount of what we'll call it. We'll go on to that in a second, but it's called class one. So I've mentioned polarity already. So looking at those various pair sets and and how they're configured, um, we've also mentioned the term. Uh, types and classes. So this is going into more into more detail now. So just looking at what we would call the the port, the RJ45 connected to all of us. Um, we obviously have the the standard TIA uh, 568B uh, wiring, and how that is configured in terms of what polarities might be presented on each one. So different polarities would would start to indicate the type of powered sourcing equipment is available to a powered device at the far end. What we have to remember is that type one represents the three classes that were released as part of the original PoE, PoE standard of 802.3 AF, and so Alpha Foxtrot. Type two represents the expansion of that, which was 802.3 Alpha Tango AT, and types three and four were released, uh, well, developed in 2015 and released, I think, officially in 2018 um, as 802.3 Bravo Tango BT. So it's it's grown over the years, but we'll go into more now the, the actual classes that are available from those types of powered sources. So here's the detail about the difference uh, or different classes encompassed by each type. So you can see the type one, the, the original ones are just these three classes here. And as I mentioned, class four, which is four watts being pr provided from the powered sourcing equipment and 3.8 watts available at the powered device. That's how most powered devices should start up. They should start up taking that much power and then negotiate with the powered sourcing equipment to move on to one of these other classes. And the vast majority of devices out there you're going to come across these days are still going to be types one and two because 30 watts or 25 watts of the powered devices is, is usually plenty for most um, wireless smaller wireless access points, uh, CCTV cameras, even lights. You know, you imagine a light, you know, an LED light these days, 25 watts is a lot of light. Um, but type three and type four, um, by utilizing all four pa pairs, it can expand on that. And um, it allows for up to 51 watts at the power device and type four allowing up to over 71 watts at the power device. So that's enough for a small display screen, a small server or even a, a laptop. Um, so, so these higher classes up here, classes eight, seven, six and five are quite uh, uh, you know, useful. Now, if you've been paying attention and reading the words on the slide, um, you'll notice that basically each type must support all the elements, all the classes within it. Type two must support class four. Doesn't mention class here, but but it does. It, it should imply that it also supports classes three down to one. Type three must support at least class one and may support up to class six. So the interesting thing is if you've got a type three device, you need to check the spec because it will definitely do a class five, but it might do class six. So again, when you're trying to match up um, powered devices against powered sourcing equipment, you have to you have to be careful and watch out for this may support or the maximum it, it'll support. Um, the same thing with type four, it may support class eight. So you might have a type four device that works at uh, 62 watts at the del delivered power, but don't connect a 71 watt device to it because it'll possibly fail. So again, you've still got to be checking the specs on devices when you're installing them. So let's have a look at uh, a, a practical debug of PoE and give you an example of what might go wrong in a real application. So in terms of PoE, what can go wrong? There are obvious failures such as the power failing at the server room causing a complete shutdown of the system. 
Hopefully, the uh, management system of the network will have flagged this up and back up UPS and generator systems kick in for critical systems. However, what such a failure might kick off is a graceful shutdown of lower priority items to ensure the core network and the critical systems can run for longer. A managed PoE switch may be programmed to switch off less critical loads in such circumstances. Um, an average user might be completely unaware of a power failure, but may have reported a fault um, due to uh, a local shutdown and the IT management team to need to sort that. Today, we're going to concern ourselves with the wiring. <laughs> a patch cord uh, could have been snagged or become damaged by mechanical action or maybe nibbled by a rat. Um, so there's there's some examples. Um, so let's always check the obvious first. If you're at a powered device, you've usually got some sort of local indication. Is there is the, is the light on or is the display active? Um, but even if there is some power, remember that a switch may have reduced the power available and a power device might be operating in a restricted power mode. So hopefully there's a little error light on it or something. Um, but not all functions are available. For that, you'll need to know about the power device. That's something we can't help you with. But if there appears to be no power or no proper function, then maybe a wire of a pair is broken. Maybe one pair is broken. Um, the power is getting through in a weird way, a mixture of current being delivered between mode A and mode B, perhaps. I'll you know, show you an example of that in a minute. If there's no power at all, um, check at the patch cord end. Maybe the powered device has just died. Um, check at the wall socket. Maybe the patch cord's broken. Check at the next patch panel and switch and you know, progressively break down the system. You, you've done fault finding before. I'm teaching you all to suck eggs. In the next slide, you'll see me diagnosing one of those weird situations where a phone is on but not working. So here we go. Here we've got a telephone and you can see it looks like it's working, but there's actually no provision. So there's no data connection. But why is it alive if, if the power of Ethernet's dead? Well, we've got a snagged cable. Um, what it appears to be doing is getting power over the two different pairs. So when we actually use the, the uh, netcat, we can see that we've got what appears to be um, data, but we're not seeing gigabit. We don't see the power over Ethernet shown either because it's not on the correct pairs. So I'm testing the cable here. So this is just now plugging the cable directly into the uh, netcat, and I can see that one of the pairs is broken. Um, at the end, the far end, so you can actually see it. I mean, so what I've taken is a, a spare patch cord that I had, and now repeat the test just using the patch cord. Make sure you've got a good patch cord before you plug it in and get panicky about it not working. Uh, takes a few seconds and then confirms that we've got a straight through connection on all pairs, and it's about three meters long, so that's good. We plug into the phone and we repeat, or plugged into the wall, I should say, repeat the test. So we immediately got our gigabit Ethernet um, correctly shown, and we've got power over Ethernet on the correct pairs. So that's that's a good sign. So what I'll do then is reconnect the device to the uh, telephone and let that boot up. And OK, at the switch, just to show you what's going on, on that screen, you can see one LED in the center slowly flashing. Well, that's being triggered by uh, link pulses from the netcat, which are always sent out at a fixed rate. And repeat that at the server room. Um, so again, repeat the test. And you can see a little flashing icon in, next to the little router symbol in there. And uh, the, the LED on the, on the device will be flashing exactly in time with that. So it's a useful little device that just allows you to check basic connectivity, basic power over Ethernet provision, and um, get the, the simple things. So let's go through what I did here. Uh, what I did here was to check that the phone was working. Well, we could see it was on, but it wasn't a phone at that point because there was no Ethernet connection. It wasn't communicating. So if somehow power was getting through, but data wasn't. Um, I checked the patch cord and saw the damage. Um, so I actually checked the provision at the end of that patch cord and there was no PoE uh, and weirdly no gigabit. So all our switches in our office are gigabit. So should have had gigabit on every single port. Um, so the Netcat Pro was receiving auto negotiation pulses from the put, from the switch, indicating that up to 100 megabits was available from the switch. But because the switch couldn't receive the pulses from the Netcat, asking for the the higher speeds, it wasn't showing any gigabit capability. Um, so there was also no correct presentation of PoE. So we could guess that there was power on the circuit because obviously the phone was somehow alive. 
but because it wasn't um, presented correctly, it wasn't shown on the on the netcat. So the netcat wasn't showing you that there was a valid power over Ethernet. It was split across basically mode A and mode B across the main pairs and the spare pairs. And um, as a result, it was, you know, the bridge rectifier inside the phone was giving the phone some power, but, you know, then it didn't have data because one of the pairs was missing. So once we then tested a good patch code and rechecked, all was good. Um, and then the second, the, the, the sort of important thing is that when you actually plug in and check, um, just to always check that you're getting the correct um, class of power um, delivered to your device. Um, it's something that's obviously device dependent about the power needs and so on, but it's always worth checking. So um, I'll pause here for a few simple questions. And I think Ashley's then got a little um, quiz for you. Um, we've got a little quiz with four questions in it, um, just to simply check that you've been paying attention. I'll get that so, right. Okay, Ashley, have, have there any um, questions been posed? The first question on the poll just launched, so feel free to answer that. Okay. Yep. Yeah. So okay, we'll we'll go on with um we'll go on with the little quiz. So if you guys can see the question on the screen, you should be able to see a poll popped up. Uh, how many different classes are available now? So in the latest version of 802.3 BT. How many classes in total are available? So if you just tap one button and then submit. Well, question number two. Which types are covered by the latest standard 802.3BT? Oh, I think people have been paying attention. This is looking good. Mm -hmm. Mark, I do have, um, can you mix PoE and non-PoE devices on a network? Uh, of course, yes. Um, the, the beauty of the system um, which is using that um, key resistor effectively and the bridge rectifiers and the center tap transformers basically means that if you have a PoE switch and you have non-PoE devices, you can plug them into that switch um, without the, without causing damage to any of those non-power over Ethernet devices. That's not a problem at all. Uh, in, in advanced um, managed switches, you know, fancy Netgear and Cisco things, the, the high-end stuff, Obviously, each port is is configured through a user interface, um, so you can actually turn um, the port power over Ethernet functions on, off, set mass, set limits for each one, set priorities for each one. As I mentioned, if if there's failures, you can actually set it so that the critical systems. So even if you're doing lighting, you might have emergency exit route lighting; those would stay on. Other lighting might be um, dimmed or even switched off. So so power over Ethernet allows the building management to do an awful lot more than um, just provide power. Um, you know, those those switches are rather expensive just for turning lights on. <laughs> but you know, that's the way that building management is going, and it's obviously still um, an advantage over running extra cables. So, is anything else popped in, Ashley? Yes. Are all voltage classes all rated at ninety slash one hundred meter distances? Yeah, basically, that's as I tried to say in the in the um, in the in the in the text. Um, everything is specified out to the full 100 meters of, of Ethernet because um, the standards are all written around what can be carried safely over those cables which are already in the field. Um, so there's no requirement for extra heavy duty cables or anything like this. They're the same cables with the same ratings that you've used purely for data and they can carry up to 71.4 watts um, in, in, the, in the highest case. Yeah, OK, another question just popped in. Um, what about non-standard PoE implementations? Uh, yes, over the years, there's been several alternative methods of providing power onto the network, and not all of those are compatible with, um, let's call it proper standardized power over Ethernet. So there might be some proprietary systems which just used what looks like Ethernet cabling and uses RJ45 sockets, but whatever you do don't plug an ordinary network device in there because it's not provided on on the pairs in in a sensible way it might damage the uh, might damage the uh, plugged in device and likewise um, those powered devices which were designed for some proprietary system might not work in fact highly likely won't work on an 802.3.af um, af at or bt um, standard poe power source um, so yeah you've got to be a bit careful about 
those older non-standard systems. But I think uh, there are very few current products being released which have non-standard systems. Um, I'm not going to name names, but there, there have been various um, pre-standardization standards developed by large companies, <laughs> um, which which yeah, most of those don't cause a problem, but certainly other other ones from smaller suppliers have caused uh, damage to problem uh, products in the past. So again, just be careful. Look at the specs on your device and make sure it works with uh, with the switches that you have. Uh, Hi, Mark. I, I got high well, voltage warning when I try to test active PoE switch supports 802.3 AF and AT. Do you have any opinion for this? Um, high voltage warning. I am surprised. Is that Hakan, can you confirm whether that's with an NC500 netcap? Because if if you're getting a high voltage warning, then I'm suspecting that the, the power of Ethernet switch is not fully standard. Because if it is... Right, okay. NC500 netcap pro 2. Yeah, what you might want to do, Hakan, is contact me um, offline and, and we can discuss that because I'll be interested to find out what your switch is and... Um, we, we can we can discuss that further. I'll put Mark's email here in the chat for you. Thanks. Great. Thank you for the awesome questions, everyone. Yeah. Um, so just a reminder that this will come out via email, but also be sure to check our website. Ah, I love it. And so social media, um, tempocom.com forward slash education. All of our upcoming webinars are there as well as our past webinars. And yes, please follow us on social media. We're on all your favorite channels. We are working hard to get some awesome content out there, especially via video and webinars. So you can find all those on your favorite social channels as well. And uh, do reach out to Mark if you have any questions. His email, again, is in the chat box there. Thank you so much for attending and giving us a little bit of your time today. Thank you, Mark, for an awesome presentation. And everyone, have a great day. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.